right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to give everyone another minute or two to arrive, uh, but we're very excited about our presentation today. Uh, I was joking right before this that if anyone had any space jokes, they should tell them now. Um, and so I have one that my third grader provided, which is how do you have a really good space party? Anyone have any guesses? Sandeep? No? Mm -hmm. You plan it. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. I, I was thinking you need to have the right atmosphere. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's a good one. That's a good one too. Yep. My third grader told that at um, Halloween. Because <laughs> if any, if any yeah. of you on the line are not from St. Louis, then you may not know that in St. Louis, you kind of have to tell a joke before you get the candy. <laughs> So that was his joke this year. You, you also don't want the party to revolve around one person. <sighs> ah. <laughs> I have one. What, what do you call a tick on the moon? What? Lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a great one. Space jokes, like, they're the gift that keep on giving. <laughs> All right, well, I think uh, we'll just give everyone one more minute and then we will get started. Let's see. All right, it is 12.02, so I'm gonna kick things off. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. This is our sixth in our series of free webinars uh, presented by Prepare.ai and some of our partners. Uh, I'm Cindy Teasdale. I'm Executive Director of Prepare.ai. If you're unfamiliar with Prepare, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Uh, we are a St. Louis-based 501c3 and our mission is to increase collaboration around AI and other fourth industrial revolution technologies in order to advance the human experience. Um, I have a couple of just uh, announcements and some admin stuff, and then we'll get right uh, to our presentation today. Uh, the first is that our final webinar of this summer, uh, which is really part two of this morning's uh, webinar, is next Tuesday. Um, it's a follow-up to this session. Uh, its title is A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, Image Analysis with OpenCV. Um, also presented by our partners at Dowerty. Um, it's free and open to all. If you go to prepare.ai, um, you can sign up today and we'll also be sending out the link uh, in the follow-up to this session. Um, and then our really big news, we are so excited to announce uh, that we have reimagined our uh, April in-person conference uh, to be a series of um, online sessions this October. We will still have all of our incredible speakers. We'll have 80 speakers, uh, over 50 sessions, uh, over five afternoons in the month of October. And our keynotes include Sarah Parkak, uh, TED Prize winner in 2016 and space archeologist, uh, as well as Marlon West, head of effects animation at Disney and so many other incredible, incredible thought leaders in AI. Um, today only for those of you on this webinar, uh, we are running a flash sale. Uh, if you go to the Prepare website and register, you will get $100 off your ticket. Uh, the tickets are only $179 total, so this means you would get in for $79. Bucks. Uh, use coupon code SPATIAL, uh, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you there. Uh, if any of you are having trouble seeing all of the speakers, there is a, a grid looking, I call it the waffle, uh, in the top right of your screen. That will allow you to see all the speakers at once. Um, and this will be a presentation style session where um, we have our presenters. We're going to hold the Q&A for the end, but feel free to ask the questions throughout the session. Um, and we will log them and then we will ask them all at the end. Uh, so now I'm going to hand things off. I'll give really brief intros of our speakers. Uh, Shanti Green is Senior Principal at Doherty Business Solutions, where he's part of the Product Engineering and Innovation Leadership Team. Uh, he's been in the data space for over 20 years and holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from Case Western, a bachelor's in psychology from the University of Hartford, uh, 
He spent three years in the marketing doctoral program at the University of Connecticut and earned a master's degree in information and data science from the University of California, Berkeley. And then Sandeep Singh. Sandeep, uh, who has a PhD, uh, is a principal consultant at Dougherty Business Solutions. Uh, he brings really deep experience in biotech, hospitality, finance, and aerospace. He's been a part of multiple space missions with NASA. Um, and he holds a bachelor's in physics, mathematics, and astronomy from Northern Arizona University, a PhD in space and planetary sciences from the University of Arkansas, and an MBA from the Olin School of Business at Washington University in St. Louis. And then finally, Angelique Zerang, uh, also a PhD, is a data scientist at Dougherty Solutions and an accomplished data analysis uh, technician. She has designed comparative analyses to measure outcomes of value to organizations and manages projects involving uh, electronic me medical records, claims, pharmacies, and marketing contact data. She holds a bachelor's uh, in, from Northern U Arizona University, a master's of science in biostatistics from the University of Arizona, I'm sorry, University of Minnesota, and a PhD in public health and biostatistics from St. Louis University. So now I will hand things off to Shanti and we'll get started. Great, uh, very nice to meet everybody today, even if virtually. A little bit about Darty Business Solutions. So we're headquartered in St. Louis. We've been around for over 30 years and we're really a technology focused consulting company. Everything from management style solutions in terms of strategy to actual implementation, we can really do that full stack. Uh, along those lines, over the last few years, we've really been growing and developing and making data science, data engineering, some of our core strengths. So we'd like to introduce some of our experts in that field, people who are really helping push the field in the right direction. Uh, so Dr. Sandeep Singh and Angelique Zarang will be talking today about some geospatial analytics. And this is really that broad overview talk. Really today, we're looking at the nature of spatial data, uh, the different types of quality issues that you can have. Uh, data quality and spatial data is a little different than just regular data, so we'll talk about that a bit. Do some exploratory analysis, the concept of spatial autocorrelation, and some statistical modeling, what type you could do in spatial data. Really, we want to talk about what are the learning objectives. This is not for the people who are already experts in geospatial data who've been doing this kind of analysis for years. We're going to talk about through some definitions of spatial data analysis, that techniques of what are we going to be doing? How could you detect relationships? Preparing data sets and some methods to examine distance effects, clusters, anomalies. There's really that broad basis. Any of these could become much deeper talks in a variety of directions. If you all, what is um, Sandeep's phone number? I'm wondering if he's it's having okay. some... um, Just go ahead and proceed, Shanti, because my, my talk's the first piece. So oh, uh, perfect. he'll, he'll uh, be on by the time we get to his section. Uh, so um, yeah, so we had a couple of personal slides, but I think he did a fun job of introducing us and we've already lost 15 minutes. So let's just proceed on ahead. Next, Shanti. <laughs> Next. Thank you. Next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, basically, uh, there are two different main types of spatial data. There's vector spatial data and raster spatial data. Uh, vector uh, basically kind of um, usually is probably the one people are most familiar with because it has to do with sort of layering information on maps. Uh, this is, an, for example, um, an illustration of uh, flooding in New Orleans with kind of um, a, a floor cleft map showing um, sort of population density with an overlay of, of the flood extent. Next. So uh, to give, if you look to the upper, um, if you look to the left of, on, on that sort of stack of layers of stuff, what you see is the up are sort of the different the main types of, um, of spatial data. There is point, 
line or polyline and polygon. So point data includes things like customers or with their addresses or say a hospital or a point source of pollution or maybe a, a, a single uh, measuring station for temperature or weather or something like that. Streets, rivers are line data and polygons are things like uh, counties, states, countries, uh, any sort of enclosed space. Vector spatial data is discrete um, as opposed to sort of continuous. Uh, Sandeep's section is going to go more over what raster data contains, but to contrast it a little bit, uh, vector data typically are the kinds of things you put on maps. And like I said, it's discrete. It represents data using points or polygons, and it's kind of complicated just simply because you have to sort of have X, Y coordinates for every, every sort of uh, element of an object. Next. So there's some things you can do with vector data. Um, operations you can do on it to make it more useful. You can layer, you can aggregate information up to the level of a point or polygon, uh, such as, or line, such as the population growth of a state, uh, the distance of a line, or revenue for a hospital, but it can be overlaid over that, um, that kind of polygon data. You can also buffer, which adds a zone. When you're dealing particularly with point data, uh, and you're doing something that really has an impact on the whole area, but is measured at a specific point, you kind of want to create a zone that enables you to sort of uh, make some assumptions about whether or not that data kind of covers that whole space. For instance, if the point was a measurement of temperature, you, it's reasonable to assume that that measurement of temperature is reasonably accurate in a, in a given geometric area. So you can use buffering to sort of define that. Uh, you can also union uh, different polygons or lines, and unioning has value. For instance, if you have an area of flooding, uh, you might want to, to define the whole area of flooding uh, using spatial data that's already in separate polygons like Woolard or County or something like that. So that's one operation you can do with spatial data that enables that. You can also difference. So differencing might be useful, say, in an agricultural um, example where you have an area that is an entire field, part of that field uh, suffered a pest or disease. So if you want to look at what was productive, you might want to difference the area that, that suffered the outbreak over as opposed to the area that remained productive. Next. So one of the most common ways to visualize vector data is by using mapping. Um, typically called chloroplast mapping. So again, that involves kind of layering levels of information. Um, and you can use texture, color, um, what have you, to sort of illustrate that. In this example, for instance, we're looking at the average elevation and feet of New Orleans, and then the flood extent after um, Hurricane Katrina. So you'll note that the areas in red are basically below sea level, and orange, uh, and yellow are pretty much right at sea level. So you can add multiple layers, as this is an example of multiple layers. We have one layer of color that kind of illustrates levels of elevation, and we have another layer that using texture to illustrate where flooding occurred. You can also layer on point data, line data, et cetera. Um, next. So, if you're working, if you're taking information and you're applying it to a map, it, you need to understand that uh, the coordinates of what those things are, that pieces of information are important. And coordinates are based on the kind of projection of a map. They aren't based on some abstract concept that applies universally. So projection really applies to how do we, we create two-dimensional maps when the globe is actually three-dimensional and curved. Uh, so, literally, it's like if you were to put a, a light bulb in a globe and then sort of uh, project that out to a, a 2D space. So, what happens then is you get distortions. The, the areas where that 2D space is the closest to the globe surface are pretty accurate in size, uh, 
but as you expand out to the edges, uh, you get more and more distortions. For instance, if you look at the example, a commonly used example for a global map uh, in the, in the right-hand corner below, you'll note that Greenland looks like it's the same size as South America, but it really isn't. Um, so that's what I mean by the distortions. The larger the space area you're working with, the bigger the distortions, because the, the more impactful that curve of the Earth is. Uh, if you're looking at state or, or city information, the distortions are minimal, but at the globe size, it's, it's quite big. So again, those coordinate systems are based on the map projection, so you need to understand what is the projection of the map, so you can make sure that you align any information you place on that map with that projection so that things are, are in sync. Next. Another important feature of, of geospatial and, and geographic information is spatial autocorrelation. Well, basically, things that are nearby typically are, are more alike things that are, that are nearby as opposed to um, things that are far away. Um, it kind of, it's a measure used to detect the variability and divergence of a data set across space. So you can have positive spatial correlation, which are when things are clustered together in space. Uh, so, for instance, asthma with, uh, with air pollution. Air pollution doesn't just happen at a single point. Air pollution spreads across an entire area. So you have kind of a wide area that incorporates that kind of air pollution. And then you also typically see a lot of asthma cases uh, that cluster with that air pollution. Um, standard statistics, on the other hand, kind of rely on in individual um, observations being independent of each other. So you run into problems when you apply standards models when data is clustered in space. Uh, so you kind of have two options for spatial correlation. You either have positive spatial correlation, which is where you have sort of clustering or things that are near that are alike being right next to each other. But you can also have negative spatial correlation, which is things that are diffuse and that diffuse in a non-random way. Next. Uh, next. <laughs> yeah, there's sort of two different kinds of measures. There are global measures, and we have a statistic called Moran's Eye, which is designed across an entire field of space that you're looking at to look at whether or not across that whole area you have spatial autocorrelation correlation or patterns of spatial autocorrelation. correlation. It's basically an, an, an average of the spatial correlation, the local spatial correlation across the whole area. Locally, you also have local areas of spatial correlation. It may be that you have things that are sort of correlated in space over here, but not necessarily over here. I keep clicking. So that enables you to kind of compute that measure for each sort of section of a geometry or geography you're trying to, to look at. Um, different patterns or processes may cause something to be correlated over here, but not necessarily correlated over here. If you add up all the LISAs, or the local measures of spatial autocorrelation, uh, you get the global measure. Um, next. <clears throat> so the statistics, like I said, calculated for each area in the data. For each polygon, you have an index calculated based on, on the neighbors. So it's, when you're looking at local, it's based on the neighbors that are surrounding it. And that LISA gives you an indication of that sort of extent of local clustering. Next. By LISA are where you have two variables and you're trying to see if they cluster together or are spread equally together. So for instance, again, that example of air pollution and asthma. Do these things all both happen in the same space when you're looking at, at space across time? Next. So to bring this home, I've, I've already used some illustrations of this, but I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about an analysis I've done using sort of vector spatial data. Uh, this is polygon data, predominantly, about New Orleans pre and post Katrina. Uh, it was a natural experiment uh, because you had census data, which is aggregated at the ward level, and you had um, at, in 2000 and 2010, and Katrina happened in 2005. So you had a measure before and a measure after, and you can do some comparison. But we looked at what are the factors associated with the greatest changes 
Um, and some of the ways that we analyzed this data was just to look at summary measures, um, chloroplast mapping, spatial, some geospatial statistics, including Moran's eye, and then spatial regression. Regression will be held off to the end because we're going to talk about um, uh, how regression measures are used both with raster and vector data. Next. So uh, Katrina was one of the strongest storms to hit the Gulf in about 100 years. Uh, the storm surge, uh, basically storm surge is when a storm pushes the water up and it pushed it up and battered the coast so high, it basically breached the levees in multiple places. In some spots, the floodwaters were more than 10 feet high in a very heavily populated area. There was widespread devastation, lots of death, and it took months for the floodwaters to recede. This resulted in massive population loss. Next. So here's a map illustrating that. We see the flood extent and we see levels of population loss, or path map. Um, red meaning areas where there was a great deal of um, population loss between 2000 census and 2010 census. Uh, the geometry, geography of New Orleans makes it particularly vulnerable because it's almost entirely surrounded by swamp, by water, in many cases, the levees are the highest elevation points in, in the city. As I had pointed out earlier, most lands below uh, sea level, so it is typically vulnerable to flooding with high rains. They have pumps to remove a lot of the water, but under the circumstances, a hurricane, heavy rain, battering storm surge, it overwhelmed their system and there was massive flooding. And that again resulted in massive population loss. And you can see that the population loss basically uh, occurred for the most part in areas where there was flooding. Next. So here's some summary measures. Um, we have kind of changes in that population. 19% of the population was lost between 2000 and 2010. Um, that was different by, uh, by race in that the white and, bl and black populations typically uh, reduced more and you actually had an influx of Hispanics and some other races who after Katrina saw an opportunity to participate in rebuilding. Um, the biggest increases in um, population were again Hispanics and people with full year education, folks with a lower education and particularly African Americans tended to leave the city. The vacancy rate nearly doubled and the space changes were, as you can see by the Moran's eye, correlated in space, spatially correlated. Next. Uh, so here is an example, not just of chloropath mapping, but of also by Lisa. So one map on the other side is basically the percent of black race, given that that was the population where you had the, the group of folks where there was the largest population loss. You see areas, and it was also, I think, the most covered in the news. So you see areas where there's a high proportion of African Americans and where the flood extent occurred. I want you to notice sort of this um, east-west pattern. So along Lake Pontchartrain, which is kind of that northern water boundary, you see that there was an area that was predominantly white. It was also predominantly uh, high educated and affluent, and then an area that was predominantly poor and black. Um, and the massive population loss, you can see from Bailisa, the areas where it were low in population loss, but right along that flood zone, and also low in black population, had low population loss, basically. Low black, those are the blue zones you see. Uh, areas that were high in percent black and high in population loss are the kind of orange areas you see. And areas that were a little more racially mixed, but still had a high population loss are kind of the red zones. So what's interesting, when I first started looking at this data, I kind of expected there to be what the news coverage uh, really focused on, which is on um, people who were poor and African-American uh, leaving the city, uh, suffering greatly, which all of course happened. The, the deaths were much higher among the black population than they were among the white population. And in fact, the flooding was much deeper in some of the areas that were African-American neighborhoods. But while this focuses on race, I did the same basic pattern based on education, based on poverty. And what I found that was the most consistent pattern was less that and more that in this area that is blue in the Bailisa plot, uh, they, 
those folks had the resources to rebuild and did. And that was a far more consistent pattern than poverty or education or race. Uh, next. Another example is looking at uh, hospital competition versus price. Um, so typically, standard uh, assumption with econometrics is that when competition increases, prices decrease. But hospitals function a little bit different uh, because of insurance, like price transparency, um, insurance not covering full cost of care, it's geographically restricted because people are not competing for patients at a local hospital from across the country. Uh, poor quality isn't just something that you can substitute, um, such as like a cheaper version of macaroni and cheese. Poor quality can kill you, uh, so people are less willing to substitute. Um, specialty care, however, is more expensive and it's mostly in areas, urban areas where there's more competition. So the, the thought is that maybe uh, price and, and competition may not operate the same way in the hospital market. So a uh, hospital, uh, anyway, one common measure of uh, competition is called the, Hirsch, the Herf and Della Herschel Index. And basically what you're doing is you're kind of looking at market share by different entities and then summing it up. Um, and that measure uh, helps you determine whether or not there's a lot of competition in a region and a lot not. So next. Now, hospital addresses are point data. Um, hospital prices are point data. But competition happens across a region. So then you have to kind of define what is the catchment area for that hospital. So what area is it competing with other hospitals for? So to do that, I use buffering. Um, and in this case, in this example, what you're seeing is a 30-mile buffer. In later iterations, we modified the size of the buffer depending on the population in the area because in rural communities, the zone of competition is much broader, so the hospital catchment area is much wider than it is in urban areas. But anyway, we generated a buffer, we used spatial joining, we computed the total number of hospitals within the buffer, and from that we uh, used, because market share is based on number of hospital beds, we could compute within that buffer what was the market share each hospital that resided in that buffer could or overlapped within that buffer uh, consisted of. The goal in this case wasn't to do a full-on spatial analysis. The goal was just to compute a measure that could be used in standard analyses. Uh, next. So um, unfortunately that project never finished. We played around with it a little bit. This is an example of um, sort of mapping price on top of that data. Uh, and it brings up, I think, a very valid point about how you use point data. So again, point data is only really truly accurate at that point. You can use a buffer. The buffer is, is based on some assumptions about the size. And generally, when you're working with spatial data, you want measures across the whole space, not just at a single point. So you have to, a lot of times, in the spaces that aren't covered, you have to kind of use a modeling approach to fill in that missing data. And that can be interpolation, which is what you're seeing here. We're just using basically kind of a moving average across what those uh, buffers were. Um, there are variograms or correlograms that help kind of get at how correlated things are and, and can be used to help kind of build a model to fill in missing data too. Uh, the estimates though are of course less accurate. Uh, with polygons, there are also other limitations. You are aggregating measures within a polygon. So uh, it may be, for instance, that in those neighborhoods in New Orleans, they aren't always cleanly cut. This is an affluent neighborhood and this isn't. Uh, sometimes you have a mixture of affluent and, and poor and what you get is an average across that space, which doesn't really give you an accurate picture. That's a loss of precision. And in fact, in, epi in uh, epidemiology, that bias that you see when you're using sort of aggregate measures to get at something that can only be seen at greater precision is called ecologic bias. Uh, so, um, yes, moving on. So, <laughs> so anyway, that is a limitation of working with polygon data. And uh, Sandeep, take it away. Perfect, thanks Angelique, and perfect introduction to vector spatial analysis, and I'll jump into uh, raster side of it. Um, so, as Angelique has talked about, like applications of uh, vector data, 
um, and has introduced a different layers of a spatial data analysis. Let's, let's switch and focus towards um, uh, raster data and how raster could help us analyze. So my goal here is to basically introduce some of the definitions in the raster analysis and techniques to detect the relationship between one pixel to another pixel. Or even uh, when I analyze the uh, raster uh, or any spatial data, uh, uh, the very first step is basically preparing the data sets, like how to think through the issues of data and, and how can I prepare the data uh, so that I can build some sort of statistical modeling on top of it. So those are some of the thinking processes that I'm going to go through um, and hopefully it will help you understand and prepare spatial data for your spatial analysis. Uh, Shanti, we can go next. Um, Okay, so so basic introduction is like you know if you guys if you guys are looking at me right now I'm actually here in the space and I'm looking at Earth behind me, and if I'm looking at it, uh, um, I'm actually covering a much wider perspective of Earth, and each image pixel is representing some information on the Earth, right? So so that's the sort of introduction um, uh, uh, we would want to see like what type of information I'm collecting. So, so of course humans, I, I can only see the visible side of the earth in there. So we have this whole spectrum of infrared, ultraviolet, radio waves, where radio waves work for radar, light detection, um, and then there's multi-spectral, multi hyperspectral analysis that we could, you could do. And you can collect this information based on uh, how low of or high of an altitude you are flying and collecting this remote sense, remotely sensed information. So three things that you should keep in mind when you're collecting remote sensing information is your spatial resolution. So how much of the information each pixel in your image is uh, representing? What's your footprint is? Uh, uh, and then you go towards temporal, re resolu uh, temporal resolution. So I'm looking at this earth right now and I'm not sitting still, I'm, re I'm, I'm revolving around earth, right? So how often do I come back? What's my frequency to uh, measure that same pixel over and over? And then we go into spectral resolution means what's my bandwidth? What's, what's, what's my band uh, 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 frequency is itself. Um, how much of information I'm collecting within uh, 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer? How am I splitting these bands? Um, that resolution is really important as well. So we can go next. Uh, so this is just the holistic view of what type of information you can collect uh, or, or work with the remotely sensed data. So Angelique worked on the left side, Angelique worked on, on the three layers of it. And then if you go into elevation and land usage, that sort of gets into um, raster information. But in the middle and the right side of the image, you can see you can get different types of information, slope, soil, land use, animal lodging, or agriculture, pollution potential. But on the very far right side of the image, you can play with different uh, parameters in your remotely sensed data and display it such a way that you can figure out what are the different components that are affecting a particular target area. Is there any correlation? Is there any color ratio that will tell me some sort of information? Later down the presentation, I'll show you an example where I have used just a visualization techniques to detect some of the organics on the planet. Uh, we can move next. But this is really important as, as we go. So this whole understanding boils down to the spatial data metrics. So let's assume we are looking at an image in, in two-dimensional P and Q space. Uh, we need to understand that how am I representing this image per pixel wise? So in this image that we are looking at, so uh, 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 we have P and Q. So we have cell A11 all the way to cell PQ36. P6, Q6, but then I have certain variables associated to each cell, whether it could be the color of those bubbles in that frozen bubbles in that lake, 
or it could be a spectral information that's on the third dimension of this image. So basically conceptualizing the real world and identifying the fundamental properties is real important. And how does that translate into my data metrics where I'm gonna build my spatial model on is really important. And then inaccuracies in your measurement process defines the uncertainty in your data metrics. We can go next. Um, so, so this is this is basically how do you go from a real world to a data matrix, and then from a data matrix you can build your uh, uh, a model on. So, if you think about it, conceptualizing and representation is really important. And how how you basically select the representation of the space, representation of time and the representation of your variables will play into the data metrics. So very first issue that you need to think of is your model quality. How do you uh, uh, define uh, basically the choice of representation versus the quality of the data itself? So you need to start thinking about the clarity of your model, how you, the clarity of how you are representing the space and clarity or the precision, how are you representing the space time information on that image? And what is your resolution? What is the consistent consistency in your data? Uh, and then when you move towards your uh, data quality, you need to think about by which complexity the reality is captured itself. Uh, so, so the data, yeah. And, and as, as, as you are thinking about this, moving this pixelated image, and now you're thinking that you're gonna write some sort of model and you wanna store this information, data matrix information into your machines. There are like three different types of information that you can store in. And this spatial images can get quite big and some, some traditional techniques might not work. So one way, which is not very common cell by cell storing, like you're capturing each pixel and storing that information variables in your machines, might not work, but the run raster length actually compresses your image. So you're only collecting the information where, where there is a, a, a pixels have some sort of information. You're marking those pixel numbers in and basically linearizing your uh, 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 data matrix itself. The third one is your quad tree, where the quad tree actually divides the raster image into a hierarchy of quadrants that has uh, 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 that are subdivided into similar values. And when those similar values cannot be divided further, those are called our leaf, leaf nodes. So there are like these three different techniques that you can talk about uh, when storing the data. Uh, we can go next. Uh, so I know I talked through the data and model quality fairly quickly. So if you guys have any questions, you guys can reach out to me LinkedIn and just take a screenshot of this and, and ask questions on, hey, how, how does this play in role? So when you're talking about model and data quality, this is the flow that you, sh you, you need to think through. Spatial quality, how is my model, uh, should I be thinking about model quality or data quality wise? Is my data accurate? Is my, do I have enough resolution? to translate some sort of information and go all the way to, do I need to collect point line or area data or how do I link my internal data sets to get to that information? We can go next. All right, so, so we talked about issues, we talked about data, let's, let's jump into some exploratory data analysis just, and uh, we can go next, Shanti. Um, and in here, I'm gonna talk about three different methods. First is, your conceptual models, visualization, and numerical models to just explore your data image. Conceptual models are basically, let's assume in these images, you get a, a spatial image, which is the far left one, and you smooth that out with some smoothing techniques, mean or median corrections, and then you subtract out of the first image, and then you are remained with the very far left, uh, right image. Now in this image, you can see that there's a lot of variations happening. There's a lot of correlation in one direction versus another direction. So you need to think about methods that are descriptives rather than confirmatory, uh, techniques that are visible, visual and resident, resi resistant to the unusual data values, techniques to stay close to the data. So, so after I do the subtraction or addition, 
I need to make sure that each pixel pixel is still representing the data correctly. You can go to the next one. So visualization methods. So second one comes out to be is visualization. This is very powerful. I and and I want to I want to spend a minute on this one. Is like if you collect any spatial image, visualization is important in how you represent and create different forms of of the same or different views of the same captured image can just uh, like represent a different information to you. So in this picture uh, or, or, or image comes from one of the papers that I published. So we were actually looking at these two creator craters on one of the asteroids and we all of a sudden in black and white image, we noticed there's a very bright spot in between one of the craters. And we couldn't tell from the spectral differences that how could this, what organics or what material does this represent? So we had to actually play with different ratios of spectrum, different resolutions, different color ratios, and then display it over to figure out and pinpoint exactly whether that feature was there or not and what that feature represented. So rendering is really important. Rendering means what to show and what type of plot to construct as you are visualizing some, some sort of image and then manipulating that. How do we operate on individual plots? Organize these plots, right? So you can actually present each of this image data into a scatter plot. Now, how do you organize your scatter plot and link them to the other images to make the sense out of it? We can go next. So uh, again, um, this is a holistic view of visualization thinking. So if you're thinking about a spatial image, and you, you want a process to think through like how I, sh how I should be thinking of a visualization standpoint. Am I just rendering the image on a univariate or multivariate uh, uh, plots here, right? So then I should be looking at scatter plot or the traces of it, or I should be displaying a time series or distribution of it. Manipulation, you should be asking a couple of questions. How do we operate? How do we organize? And if I operate, what should I be focusing on? Should I be focusing on finding patterns or should I be focusing on creating new plots or, or new ratio tech, uh, like coming up with new uh, engineering, feature engineering methods to do so? And then once you have defined all of this method, you can actually store the data, uh, create your variables and push it forward towards advanced statistical model. We can go next. Uh, we can skip this. <laughs> Um, okay, so the third one we have is numerical methods. Uh, so we talked about conceptualized, we talked about visualization, and now how can numerical methods. So one thing is uh, map smoothing. I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of it. So there is simple techniques like mean smoothing, median smoothing. So you can actually just take the ratios of mean and median and then smooth your maps to, to make it more informative. Um, and, and you can take different spectral ratios or any other different ratios um, that you can think of will display any information. So sometimes when you think of smoothing techniques uh, in, 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 the lower, in, the, in the lower bar here, you can see uh, uh, images, uh, smooth images, you can see at the edge, it's very blurry, right? So you're losing some of the information there. So it could be either or, or. So in that areas, particularly if you are looking for analyzing that particular area, you can use some sort of non-linear uh, not non-linear smoothing techniques. And then you can use clustering techniques like kernel des des um, and density estimations to figure out if you are sampling and you have undersampled data and you need to figure out a point somewhere where there is no information, you can use kernel density estimations. And uh, Angelique talked about LISA and by LISA, uh, so I won't go into that a little bit. We can go next. So, so this is, this is something, um, information is like thinking process. Now the question comes down to is how do we quantify these models? Like how much quantification, quantification we can deduce from the limited data. So in the right side and the left side, you can see, uh, left side, there is all, a lot of information per pixel, right side, there is a very little information per pixel. So now this, <clears throat> type of information actually, you, there are some techniques you can use to drive information and, and get some analysis out of it. So that's, this is where Angelique was talking about cardiograms and variograms uh, to figure out uh, 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 
if if there is some sort of correlations or not in that in in that data we can go next and i'll introduce you to a very basic geostatistical model which is an additive model so think about uh, you have some sort of spatial variation, a mixture, which is, which is a mix of slow varying function and a fast varying function, where fast varying function has a zero mean. So in this example, you can see that you have in the top row images, you have uh, a, a rough image with some sort of pattern in it, some sort of variation, and then you've smoothed it out and subtracted, and then you have a, a, a very uh, fast varying function image left here. So now from that image, you can deduce a lot of information. So what is the variation of that image? How much is my uh, uh, image varying from pixel to pixel? What is the correlation length between my one pixel to the other pixel or one pixel to the third pixel? And something we call it an isotropy means the direction that you have a correlation in, like in, in that image, uh, the far right one and the top row, you can see that you have a correlation in, in, in one direction, but there is no correlation in the other direction. And then smoothness comes to is when you are basically, uh, 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 you have very little correlation uh, when you go from pixel to pixel in one uh, area, smooth area. And then random noise is when your pixel have a very uh, zero or no correlation between one pixel to another pixel. We can go next. All right, so, so all of that information still can be used to figure out what is, what is the similarity between, similarity in my images. So we can actually click two or three times, Shanti. Uh, <clears throat> so here, what I'm trying to figure out is how are these pixels correlated to each other? I'm trying to figure out the spatial similarity. So if I go from a, 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 a very bottom pixel and go in one direction, I can figure out what my head is and tail is. And I can go do this for all the pixels and plot them on, on a scatter plot and fit a correlation and find a correlation out of it. So then what we call that is experimental correlogram. So we will have um, uh, in the center here, uh, you, can, you can see experimental correlogram, right? In one direction, which is head and the tail, I have certain correlation. But if I move that direction of an arrow to another arrow, uh, if you click one more time, Shanti, I think I have some, so this one. So this arrow has some different direction than the other, other arrows. That means now I'm calculating correlation in that direction. So I can go through that in a very fast different directions and get experimental correlograms um, about my image. Um, and, and, and that can display a certain type of information to me and say, uh, or, or can be fed into my advanced statistical modeling uh, and become an attribute uh, uh, to predict something. We can go next. So I talked about similar measure of similarity. Now, how do we measure uh, a dissimilarity in our image here? So when we talk about that, we talk about variograms. So, so if we take the same scatter plot, uh, and uh, uh, calculate basically a distance, a square distance from 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 the mean or the 45 degree angle here. We can we can uh, uh, basically come up with a variogram here. Um, and if we think about a relationship between your autocorrelation function, your covariance, and your variogram, the shape of your plot, the shape of your function doesn't change. The only thing that changes your similarity and dissimilarity. So autocorrelation has a specific correlation here at one angle uh, or, or in one direction, you may have a correlation of one and covariance is just a standardized uh, by variance of autocorrelation function. So it's the, mirror, it's, it's the image of it. But variogram is just a mirror image of it. So which, which actually tells you the dissimilarity of your observations. And we can go next. And this sort of leads into me introducing you to uh, a, a very simple model of an ordinary least square where you could use all of this information. So I'm gonna go through, I have about maybe, oh, I have maybe one minute left. I'll go through quickly here. So you're, this is just a simple model where you have a presence of deers in each pixel and then you're, you're, you're displaying a heat map of where the deers are 
are, are, are collecting and then you're building your attribute model, running OLS on top of it. And then you can predict the residual estimated and actual values on each pixel and make sure that your uh, residuals are at random. Basically your under predictors or over predictors are at, at random by introducing these concepts into your image. And, and I'm talking only about very few variables here, but you can actually add your variograms and your correlograms and then other features to this model to make your OLS actually have a greater predictability. We can go next. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, you can do regression analyses with vector data. Uh, two different models are commonly used, special lag and special error models. Both have slightly different assumptions. Uh, for the New Orleans example, uh, the spatial lag model fit um, the best. And uh, so that's what we went with. And that's the middle model. Um, so that's all we have time for. <laughs> um, we'll, we're going to leave you some, with some useful tips. You can take a screenshot of it, uh, uh, email us your questions. Uh, we can go next slide. Uh, and. If, if uh, uh, and I also want to sh make a shout out to the book that I read um, and it's really important and some of the information from this presentation came from this book, so it's referenced below. Um, but, but this is some key take points actually, if you didn't listen to the presentation and some technical, dis uh, uh, but take this home and, and think about it uh, as you are analyzing your spatial data. Thank you. And we have two minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sandeep and Angelique. Thank you. So did we have any questions in the chat? Let me take a quick look over here. We do. So, yeah, we've got one from uh, Mark Amoroso. Uh, is there a way to account for geographical barriers such as mountains or impassable areas? Uh, he says he's run into this when calculating distances between objects like access to hospitals in rural settings. So I think you just sort of rethink or reframe the problem. Um, what I wish at the time we could have done when we were fiddling with the hospital stuff is use uh, Google mapping data to determine drive times uh, because that will take into account the barriers because you have to drive around them, right? So I think there are different ways of reframing the problem. Uh, so that's one way of approaching it. Cool. And then I was wondering, you know, your these methods are all fascinating. How are you all using them in client uh, situations today, or how are you applying them in in sort of business contexts? Uh, so the most consulting of all answers, it depends. It <laughs> depends a lot on what the specific client need is. If they are looking for us to help them actually do geospatial analysis or just set up different parts of the problem, or maybe come in where data has already been collected, look at the data, potentially help with cleaning the data. It would be nice to occasionally be brought in to answer a question like, hey, we have this great clean data, could you help us analyze it? But that's rarely the case. So often it'll be recommendations on the type of data that they might be collecting, um, especially if you look at questions related to COVID and the spread, we're looking a lot at a lot of geospatial data around locations, distance locations, travel to and from those locations. And adding on to that, uh, uh, as I uh, like, as I focused more on the the quality and the model quality and the issues, that's the type of the information that comes the most to us. Is like, hey, like I have this data, I can't like I know I want to do some sort of statistical modeling to it. Just taking them from from, from the data to the statistical modeling, that entire process in the middle is really important. And that's where we come in and help our clients. <clears throat> cool. And then I know we're at time. One more question. Uh, this is from Roland Vasquez Molina. Uh, is buffering the method that is used to produce minimum resistance algorithms, such as plotting the shortest distance to drive from, a point, from point A to point B, or is there a different method? Um. Shortest distance to, not necessarily, I mean, buffering would sort of set up the zone in which you calculate that. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, because again, the Earth is curved, there are actually, um, you know, geometric methods for calculating distances. 
and distance gets defined a bunch of different ways. You can define distance as a drive time. You can define distance as a geometric distance. It, it, it really kind of depends on the use case. I'd, I'd need a little more specific information to sort of answer that in more detail. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. And apologies again for the technical difficulties in the beginning. Uh, we will be sharing a webinar, I mean, a video of this webinar. We will edit out the technical uh, issues. And we look forward to hopefully seeing all of you again next week. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.